Friends, the first thing I could say is I wish you had been there. It was a fantastic meeting. Um, when the president of the UMC Council of Bishops preached for the opening service of the General Conference, there was much hope in the room. It was palpable. There was excitement. There was a generalized sense of relief, of purpose, of coming together in agreement. The theme for the meeting was, know that I am God. And there was a generalized sense that we were there resting in God and seeking to do uh, God's work um, in a concerted effort. A lot of things happened in the voting sessions and business sessions. A lot of things happened in the, the worship sessions. You can see both of those um, online. There, there are videos of the worship especially. The business sessions will be harder to wade through because you don't have all the documents in front of you to understand what petition is what. Um, but for the basics, um, regionalization was voted on and it passed overwhelmingly. Um, now regionalization is something that can't happen at one instance because it was essentially requesting changes to the Constitution of the UMC. So it will have to be ratified um, by the aggregate of the votes of all the annual conferences as they meet over the next year. So that means that if 500 people from Western North Carolina vote and 1,000 people from North Carolina vote and 300 from Congo and 300 from the Philippines will total all that up and then figure out what the overall vote was and it has to surpass two thirds for it to be approved and, and take effect. So it'll be a year before we see all the, the details of what was voted on at General Conference come to pass or, or even know exactly if this truly uh, did happen. Um, Many of the things that did carry through and were already, are already established are some things in terms of language about the queer community. Um, funding bans, for example, there was a ban on anything related to LGBTQ people, so um, the, the church was unable to um, work towards suicide prevention of youth in the LGBTQ community. So bans like that have been removed. Um, bans against um, homosexuals being accepted, welcomed into the church fully. Um, bans against uh, marriage and weddings. But nothing that would um, force any church to do something it is not ready to do. So there's no longer, for example, a ban against my celebrating a gay marriage, but there is nothing to say that Wingate United Methodist Church must open its doors to celebrate a um, homosexual wedding. Does that make sense? So there's no ban now, but there's still that, that opening for churches to respond now as they see fit. Um, same thing for ordination. Language was removed to make that an impossibility. Now it would be up to people going through the very same process I've been working through for the last seven years um, toward my ordination being recognized by the UMC. At any stage along the process, somebody could be excluded for any of a thousand reasons. Um, but they would still have to go through the same process. But there was no ban specifically on language around uh, being part of the queer community. Um, one thing I found interesting um, was that among the Portuguese interpreters, somebody raised the, the comment, 
how do you define queer? How do you use that uh, translated into Portuguese? And three of us were talking and we all said, I have no earthly idea. So I, I pinpointed someone, one of the, the queer delegates who was there at the convention. I asked them and they said, hang on, I've got some contacts. Let me talk to them. He took me up and introduced me to some folks who were um, fluent in Portuguese, who were from Africa. And I had explained what queer meant. And um, they talked for a bit and said, we have no idea. I don't understand that concept. And then one of the other interpreters that I hadn't talked to said, oh, I hear that on the news all the time from Brazil. They just say queer. They don't have a word for it. They just use the English word, queer. Um, that to say that there is not uh, uniformity around the world, uh, going beyond simply the church or even the queer caucus in the UMC on, on all things, and that there's difference in, in how things are developing in different parts of the world and different parts of the church. Um, another issue that came up was ending disaffiliations. Uh, that was one of the big issues that was being brought forth. Um, in committee, the vote to end disaffiliations passed by a vote of 45 to 2. Um, that went then on to the consent agenda to get on the consent agenda, anything a committee did had to have less than 10 votes against. Uh, if it had less than 10 votes against, it went on the consent agenda. Somebody could still say, I want to take that off the, the consent agenda. So they needed to get 20 votes, um, 20 signatures rather, to remove something from the consent agenda. And then it would be dealt with separately. Uh, this was not taken off the consent agenda. It was voted in overwhelmingly. Um, regionalization needed two-thirds vote. It got uh, three-quarters vote. Um, when people went back and calculated the, the question of, well, what about delegates from Africa who could not be present for one reason or another? If they had all voted against regionalization, it still would have surpassed the two-thirds mark um, had they all been present and against it. Most of the votes um, taken on the floor were passed by margins of at least 75% uh, in favor, one quarter against. Most of the votes that I was seeing were in the upper 80s or in the 90s. Um, on almost everything that was put forth. I didn't see anything with um, numbers below 60%. There may have been something and I just wasn't present for that. But everything just passed overwhelmingly. Um, There's a spirit of, of unity and that we were gathered for the same purpose. And um, another big thing that happened is that the Eastern Europe, um, three annual conferences, wanted to pull out of the UMC because of political and cultural realities in their part of the world. Um, they had voted as annual conferences to leave. They had talked with the European um, Central Conference. They, the vote had passed there overwhelmingly, and Europe was recommending to the UMC that they be allowed to leave. And that vote passed something above 90% in favor of allowing them to leave. The statement made with that was, um, we are not against the UMC in anything. Uh, this is just happens to be where we are at this point in time. We need to leave. and. Hopefully at some point in the future, we will be able to come back. Uh, and that was the sense of we, we will allow them to leave, but hope sometime down in the future be able to, to reestablish those, those ties. Um, 
What does regionalization mean? Um, somewhat akin to our having a federal government and having state governments and then having municipal governments, right? We have different levels at which um, ordinances or laws or regulations are passed. And some things are appropriate at a local level, right? Uh, town of Wingate, Town of Monroe, uh, City of Charlotte, they pass ordinances regarding zoning and housing districts and dealing with water and sewage and trash and all those things, right? And they make their own decisions. Certain decisions are made at the state level. Um, and the state makes those decisions. Other decisions are made at the national level and they apply to everyone, right? So in the UMC, the American church, um, we were doing everything at the federal level. Our book of discipline applies equally to all the churches in North America. What had been happening though is that years ago, we gave authority to the central conferences, um, Philippines, um, Europe, Africa, gave them the authority to adapt the Book of Discipline to their context. But they would vote on our version of the Book of Discipline. So in a sense, they were telling us what to do and we were giving them the option of doing something other than what we decided should be done. Does that make sense? So now, according to the regionalization plan, if this goes through, we will be one more central conference, essentially. Okay. We will have freedom to do some of the things, adapt some things according to our context, the way that is done in Africa and Europe and the Philippines. And other things, such as the... Um, um, the Constitution of the UMC, the doctrinal statements, and those central things, those are still kept at the global level. And that, that would require the whole church to vote on those things. But some of the issues would be addressed possibly at the regional level in terms of how it applies. Um, some of the things, for example, that I heard in committee that, that might be um, needed to be addressed differently. Uh, there was one question that came up in committee about having um, someone at each annual conference responsible for um, promoting uh, the care of creation, stewardship of creation at every annual conference. So one of the delegates from the US said, well, I want to hear from my African colleagues to see how this would affect them. Because I don't want to vote on this if it's going to have a negative effect on them that I'm unaware of, right? So the African delegates responded. One of them said, well, we've been doing this and such for 15 years. Another said, well, this is how we're addressing the issue, and, and this is how we've been doing it for two decades. The church in the Dominican Republic said, well, um, we do stewardship of, the, of creation the same way we handled stewardship of financial resources. The very same organization in charge of our financial stewardship is also in charge of stewardship of creation. We figure they're, they're both part and parcel of the same thing. They've already adapted to things that we haven't done here in the US church. And the delegate responded by saying, okay, so we're just playing catch up. There's some things on which one church or another will be playing catch up on one particular issue because of the reality on the ground. Uh, some of the differences are in terms of uh, retirement plans. Uh, 
Other issues that we do right now in terms of annual conferences are in terms of base pay for clergy in according to their status and seniority and so forth. Um, that needs to look different here in the US than it would in um, Congo because the reality is different on the ground. So there, there are issues like that that are dealt with separately. Um, we have concerns in terms of our equality, um, in terms of who is represented at meetings in the US between are we all white? How many uh, black people are involved? How many Latinos? How many indigenous people? Well, how do I use the term indigenous if we're in Norway? What does indigenous mean? The definition is completely inadequate, right? Because it does not address the reality on the ground. So what does it look like in terms of having equal representation among races in Congo? How many white people are actually there? How many Latinos are actually there? Um, it's a different setting. It's a different context. And so they would be addressing that from a different perspective. They might be looking at uh, ethnic groups native to that area. Um, in Nigeria, it could be the Hausa and the Fulani and the Igbo and, and other peoples. And are they allowing them adequate representation? Okay. That's kind of a 30,000 foot view. Um, do you have any questions that I could maybe answer more directly? Not right now. <laughs> okay. Um, feel free to to send any questions my way, and and we'll we'll deal with them more directly. Um, uh, nothing um, major is is going to change in terms of who we are as Wingate United Methodist Church. Um, in the in the language that was set forth and the policies that were put forth. Um, there may be a couple of things that would affect our um, annual conference. For example, the um, creation care, we actually already have somebody doing that. So we are actually a step ahead of what was voted on at conference. But there may be some other things like that that, that come into the mix, that, um, looking at how we are how good a job we're doing on, on various issues and, and how to get us more aligned. There's going to be some <clears throat> shuffling of bishops, uh, the number of bishops and, and what districts are being covered in response to the disaffiliations and making sure that the number of bishops covering different geographic areas of the US is appropriate given the number of churches, given the membership, given the geographic um, um, spread. Uh, there may be some changes in terms of dividing lines of annual conferences, but those will be things that will be dealt with at the uh, jurisdictional conferences. Um, they would not be uh, dealt with from at the general conference level. So those are some changes that could come down the road. How many um, countries participated? How many countries participated? Africa, yeah, like Africa. Okay, um, Africa. I know we had Mozambique, Angola, Congo, South Africa, um, Malawi, Nigeria. Liberia, um, so that's Europe. seven. I think there were about 10 different countries in Africa and they're divided into a, two or three different conferences. I don't remember exactly. Uh, Europe, I know of uh, delegates from 
England, from Germany, from Finland, Norway, Sweden, um, those I encountered directly. I, there are others too. Um, among the interpreters we had, uh, among just the, the Portuguese speaking interpreters, we had people from Brazil, one uh, who's from Brazil but lives in Paris, um, one from um, Angola, one from Mozambique, um, I think one from Portugal, um, but there were from all over, but most of them living in different places of the US. Um, I don't have a good number of uh, the nations represented, but I would say it's at least 30. One of the interesting things to me that, that they did at every session, um, they would report from uh, committees who were looking at uh, representation among speakers, uh, in the committees and the subcommittees, and then in the, the plenary sessions. And there would be a breakdown between male and female, uh, white, black, native, um, and for the first time, we had some people who listed themselves as um, non-gendered or gender non-conforming or something along those lines. I don't remember exactly what the, the term used. So we had uh, those represented and, and put up on the, on the pie chart. Um, on one of them, for the first time, we elected more women than men on, in one category. Um, that was uh, mentioned. We also did the breakdown between clergy and lay delegates to see how we were doing in giving voice to both clergy and to laity, men, women, um, white, black, native, etc. cetera. Um, for one of the first times, uh, or the first time, a, a Native American uh, bishop uh, was presiding at conference for one of the sessions. Um, for the first time, the a um, African American woman was elected bishop um, and is um, president of the Council of Bishops. Well, that's a, a first in Methodist history. So there were several things along those lines that were. Uh, visible throughout the course of the, the meeting. So every time we would have a new session, it would be reporting on these kinds of things. Um, it was also interesting to note that 90% of everybody, as they were introducing themselves, not only gave um, gender and clergy versus laity and ethnic standing, but um, many also gave their pronouns. They were required to do the others, but we also had the, the pronouns being presented by a majority of, of the speakers, uh, which marked a very big change or difference in the, the atmosphere. Um, any other questions? And how many in the US did you say? Was each state uh, So, um, each annual conference would have representatives, um, delegates, at least uh, one lay and clergy from each annual conference, but I don't remember the numerical breakdown. There were all total about 860 delegates who were present and seated. Um, there was possibility of another 100 delegates that did not make it or had not made it at the beginning of conference. Uh, those hundred were mainly from Africa. Some of it was due to the State Department not issuing visas. Some of it was due to um, somebody not being able to log into their email because 
internet connection was too spotty and they didn't get documentation in time. Some of it was one annual conference didn't follow the rules in terms of reporting the delegates correctly. Uh, there were lots of issues like that. We did have some people show up who did not have proper credentials. They, they had not received a letter uh, commissioning them as a delegate from an appropriate entity. There was a church up in Massachusetts that sent letters um, to some people in Africa inviting them to be delegates to the convention. And it, that's a church that's disaffiliated. Uh, so there was, there was some shady things going on as well. Uh, but all of that was checked carefully and um, addressed with as much grace as possible. And uh, one delegate from uh, Germany was coming through the line and had to see his credential. And he said, I just got this at the airport yesterday when I was leaving Germany. So he had it in his email. Uh, so there were issues even in, in Germany that, that didn't make all the, the process in appropriate time, shall we say. It would be the same number yeah. because but, the, the delegates have to be equally split between clergy and laity. But when they get ready to have the next annual or general conference in 2028, do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, in 2027, yes, they're about, when we go to annual conference, we'll be voting for the delegates that, and they do encourage us to, you know, be diverse in that. Our hardest one to get is young people. <laughs> yeah. That's not a problem in Africa. It is for us. No, for us, it's the, the guy who gave me the dress from Africa was, was a young guy from mm -hmm. Sierra Leone or something like that. Mm -hmm. Phil? Are there going to be issuing a new discipline? Uh, there will be uh, a new discipline coming out sometime next year. Um, all of the uh, reports and the changes to the discipline that were passed have to go through all of their procedures and all the, they have to be translated into all the appropriate languages as well um, before they can be published. Um, and there are some issues like the regionalization that is going to take time until all the annual conferences can vote on it. So I'm not sure if we will see a new discipline in January of 2025 or maybe in August of 2025 because those are some major changes that, that deal with the, the overall structure of the UMC and they are, um, so I'm not sure when exactly, but it will be sometime in 2025 that we'll get a new discipline. Are, are the social principles part of the book of discipline? Yes, they are. And there were changes specifically to paragraphs 161 and 162. There were others as well, but those are the two numbers that I particularly uh, heard over and over. So, uh, and those were about um, removing language uh, that was harmful to the queer community. Okay. 
Other questions? Yes, yes. There were also some some petitions, for example, um, to um, ask the entities of the UMC, not require them, but to ask them to assess um, their relationship in terms of investments in countries who have long-term military occupations. Um, and there are about three countries right now that would apply to. Uh, Israel, Morocco, and I've forgotten which the other one is. Libya, maybe? I don't remember. Um, who have long-term occupation issues. And um, the statement with that was, uh, we don't need to be putting our money into... Um, support of long-term military occupation because of the uh, humanitarian cost of that. So um, that was, that became a resolution and not a um, um, requirement. Just the way that was, uh, was put forward. So there are some things like that that were referred to an institution um, like um, finance administration or um, uh, uh, discipleship or church and faith, church and society or faith and order or whatnot um, that they would then deal with. But this is a, um, a word from the conference for them to assess. And if you have any other questions, I'll be glad to research the answers. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you all.